This is another in our series of lectures, Illusions, Delusions, and Confusions, about cartographic myths on old maps. A cartographic myth is a geographic feature that appears on a map, but not on the earth, an island where there are but waves, and quested kingdoms and cities which do not exist. This lecture concerns one of the latter, El Dorado, one of the most famous legends of all time, a myth which has all the elements of a great story, riches, adventures, madness, and deaths. It also involves maps, for El Dorado became one of the longest lasting cartographic myths of all. The myth of El Dorado was in circulation for about 50 years before it appeared cartographically, but once it was put on the map, it didn't disappear for almost three centuries. The myth began as the story of El Hombre Dorado, that is, the golden man. As with many legends, there was probably a factual basis underneath the layers of fiction which built up, though it is not certain what the facts of that basis are. It is known that the legend of El Hombre Dorado had its beginnings in what are today the central Colombian highlands, centered on Lake Guatavita, not too far from Bogota. In the early 16th century, it seems that the local Musca or Chipcha Indians had some sort of ceremony involving their chief, Lake Guatavita, and at least some quantity of gold. The most common story is that a newly crowned chief was coated in gold dust before bathing in the lake. A golden raft made by the Chipcha, now in the Museum del Oro in Bogota, is supposed to show this ceremony. In any case, sometime between 1535 and 1541, the Spanish heard rumors of El Hombre Dorado. Now, this was not too long after earlier rumors of great wealth in the New World had proved to be spectacularly true. About 1517, Hernán Cortés heard tales of a great and rich kingdom on the Central American mainland, and this turned out to be the Aztec Empire. Then about a decade later, Francisco Pizarro followed up stories of another rich kingdom further south. This turned out to be the Inca Empire. With these two precedents, it is not surprising that the Spanish got pretty excited when they heard of a possible third source of fabulous wealth. The Spanish set out for Lake Guatavita region, but when they got there, they did not find El Hombre Dorado. In fact, they found almost no gold even after several attempts to drain the lake. This did not make them happy. Thus, they used every means of persuasion they knew of, most of which were violent, to try to get the local Indians to fess up about where the gold was. The Indians soon realized it was to their advantage to send the Spanish off somewhere else to look for the gold. So they started telling them, in effect, oh, that hombre dorado, yes, we know where he is, over the mountains that way. The Spanish, having already tortured everyone in sight and not having found any gold, decided they would set off to try to find this elusive hombre. Beginning in 1542 and lasting about for another half century, the Spanish search for El Hombre Dorado worked its way slowly across the northern part of South America. From the Colombian highlands down into the Amazonian basin and then into the grasslands to the east of the Andes, the search moved ever eastward. Time and again, the Spanish would arrive in an area which they had been told was the location of El Hombre Dorado only to find none of the riches they sought, even after questioning the locals, who would always end up telling them, oh, that hombre Dorado, yeah, he resides over that way. The conquistadors launched a number of major expeditions in search of this mythical figure, including those of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco de Orellana in 1541, and Pedro de Ursura and Lope de Aguirre in 1560 wasting much effort, expense, and hundreds of lice, both native and Spanish. The madness which consumed the Spanish is forcefully portrayed in Werner Herzog's movie, Aguirre, The Wrath of God. The enormous cost expended and horrors experienced on these expeditions made the search for El Dorado one of the most powerful legends of the New World. At some point, the story began to morph in its content as well as location, for the search began to focus on a rich kingdom or city rather than on a man, the legend becoming simply El Dorado. By the late 16th century, the Spanish became convinced that El Dorado, 
never where it was supposed to be, always over that way, was located in one of the most inaccessible parts of South America, the Guiana Highlands between the Orinoco and Amazon rivers. In 1584, Antonio de Berrio, who by then had received the royal governorship for El Dorado, should it ever be discovered, heard from the Indians that there was a large lake, called Lake Parama after the Indian word for big lake, located in the Guiana Highlands. Supposedly, this lake was so big it took three days to paddle across, and upon its shores was located a rich city. To Berrio, this was obviously the legendary El Dorado. This belief was confirmed when he heard the fabulous tale of one Juan Martinez, who gave Berrio a sworn deposition on his deathbed. According to that report, Martinez had been on a ship sailing on the Caroni River when its gunpowder exploded. Blamed for the accident, Martinez was left behind as punishment. Martinez claimed that he was rescued by friendly Indians who took him to a city called Manoa, perhaps from another Indian word meaning Big Lake, where the palace was made of gold. Martinez further claimed he was given great riches when he left, but that they were stolen from him on his return trip. Thus it was that Berrio became certain that El Dorado was the city of Manoa located on Lake Parma in the interior of Guiana. He sent out a number of expeditions to find the city, but all were, naturally, unsuccessful. At this time, another famous figure makes his appearance in our story, Sir Walter Raleigh, who convinced Queen Elizabeth that he could discover for her, quote, a better Indies for Her Majesty than the King of Spain has any. One of Raleigh's captains had captured a Spanish report which detailed Berrio's search for El Dorado, convincing Raleigh that this was a prize worth pursuing for his queen. Raleigh set sail from England in 1595, captured Berrio, and convinced him to tell all he knew about El Dorado. Berrio told him that he, what he had come to believe, and Raleigh bought the story Hook, Line, and Sinker, writing, quote, I have been assured by such of the Spaniards as have seen Manoa, the imperial city of Guiana, which the Spanish call El Dorado, that for the greatness, for the riches, and for the excellent seat, it far exceedeth any in the world. It is founded upon a lake of salt water of 200 leagues long, like unto the mare Caspian. Despite several unsuccessful subsequent expeditions in search of the Golden Kingdom, Raleigh remained undaunted and continued to try to convince the queen to allow him to find and conquer El Dorado. In 1596, Raleigh published a book, The Discovery of a Large, Rich, and Beautiful Empire of Guiana, which included a full description of Manoa or El Dorado, conflating many of the old stories which had been told of this legendary place. In 1603, after Queen Elizabeth died, her successor, James I, who was immune to Sir Walter's charms, threw Raleigh into the pot Tower of London. Raleigh petitioned James to get out so he can continue his search for El Dorado. Eventually, James was convinced enough to allow Raleigh out on this mission, but only on the condition that he not get into a fight with the Spaniards. Raleigh set out for South America in 1617, and through a series of misfortunes, including battles with the Spanish, which resulted in the death of his son, returned to England a failure. James threw him back into prison, and soon thereafter, at the urging of the King of Spain, Raleigh was beheaded, one of the last deaths directly related to the search for El Dorado. Though his search for the fabled Golden City failed, Raleigh did manage to put El Dorado on the map for the first time. While he was working on his discovery of Guiana, he prepared a manuscript map, perhaps originally intended for inclusion in this book. The map is hard to read, but if we overlay an outline, we can see that Raleigh included the concepts he had been given by Berrio, including the city of El Dorado and a long caterpillar-like lake. Even with the outline, the map is a bit hard to decipher, as it is oriented to the south. If we turn it over, we can get a better idea of Raleigh's mapping, with the northern coastline of South America clearer at the top, and with the Lake of Manoa and El Dorado lying between the Orinoco and Amazon to the south. 
Raleigh's map was never published, but a printed map showing El Dorado was issued in 1598 by Dutch cartographer Jodicus Hondius. Hondius didn't base his map on Raleigh's manuscript map, but instead used the descriptions of Guiana provided by the publications of Raleigh and one of his captains, Lawrence Chemus. Lake Parma is located in essentially the same place as on the Raleigh map, though now Manoa is on the northeastern shore rather than at the eastern end where Raleigh had drawn it. Hania's map was followed the next year by close copies made by Theodore de Brie and Levinus Hulsius in publication based on Raleigh's discovery of Guiana, further spreading the legend of El Dorado throughout Europe. In 1625, a modified mapping of Guiana and its cartographic myth appeared, showing a Paramalacus that has a less elongated shape and with Manoa moved to the northwest corner. This map was drawn by Hessel Gerritz for Johannes de Lott's book on the New World. De Lott was one of the founding directors of the Dutch West India Company, and for the maps to be included in his book, he chose Gerritz, who was the official cartographer for the Dutch East India Company. De Lott and Gerritz would have had access not only to the published sources on Guiana, but also to the private papers of the West India Company, and it is perhaps based on those sources that the modifications were made. In any case, this became the standard mapping for Guiana, starting with William Blau in 1630, and this rendering of El Dorado and Lake Parma continued to appear on maps for almost another century, for instance, on this map by Peter van der Aa from 1707. Lake Parama and Manoa continued to be included on maps of northern South America even into the middle of the 18th century, though the lake took on different shapes and Manoa moved around a bit. This is nicely demonstrated on this map by the British cartographer Emmanuel Bowen from about a century and a half after this cartographic myth first appeared. However, by the early 18th century, doubts about the existence of Manoa and Lake Parama began to grow. Some of the more scientifically inclined and thus skeptical cartographers, such as Vincenzo Maria Coronelli or Guillaume de Lille, either showed Manoa and the lake with notes calling them into question or didn't show the cartographic myth at all, instead just including a note mentioning its possible existence. De Lille's map of South America from 1700 includes just a statement that some cartographers put Lake Parma in the region south of the Orinoco, and interestingly, he includes a small depiction of Manoa, according to the Indians. By the late 18th century, most geographers had figured out that there wasn't a city of gold in the region, for despite many years of searching, no evidence of Manoa or any other large and wealthy city had appeared. Eventually, the idea of searching for El Dorado came to have the connotation of a hopeless quest. However, Lake Parma had taken on a life of its own. I guess people forgot that the lake was simply part of the legend of El Dorado, thinking that there, there was an independent evidence for its existence. In the late 18th and early 19th century, a number of expeditions were set out to find Lake Parma, all without success. However, the Guiana Highlands are especially inaccessible, and as it is always harder to prove the non-existence of something than to prove that it does exist, Lake Parma continued to appear on maps even after El Dorado itself had disappeared. This 1775 map was by Thomas Jeffreys, geographer to the King of England and one of the leading cartographers of the late 18th century. It clearly shows the lake, but adds a note that, quote, on the brink of Lake Parma, the ancient geographers did place the town of Manoa or El Dorado. This is a nice example of the fact that once a place, real or fictional, appears on a map, it tends to stay on the map. Still, the end of the 18th century was almost the end of the cartographic myth. From 1799 to 1804, German explorer and scientist Baron Alexander von Humboldt explored northern South America in part looking for Lake Parma. His extensive survey of the region led him to conclude that the lake did not exist. Humboldt's prestige was such that this tended to remove Lake Parma from most maps, but not all. A later geographer to the British king, William Faden, prominently showed Lake Parma in 1807. 
Faden was the successor to Thomas Jeffries, and not only did he follow Jeffries in showing Lake Parima, but he seems to have doubled down on its existence. On this large map of South America, the lake has increased in size, and a legend calls it, quote, Golden Lake or Lake Parima, called likewise Parana Pitinga, i.e. White Sea, on the banks of which the discoveries of the 16th century did place the imaginary city of Manua del Dorado. Such was Faden's prestige that his depiction of Lake Parma was followed by many British cartographers in the early 19th century, such as on this map by John Pinkerton from 1818. Even after Humboldt, other expeditions went looking for the lake, all without success, but the legend lingered on even into the second half of the 19th century. The 1853 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica listed Lake Parma as one of the, quote, only sheets of fresh water in South America which vie in magnitude with those of the St. Lawrence, going on to say, quote, the Cordillera of Parama enclosed again amongst its ridges the Great Lake Parama. Lake Parama also continued to appear on some later 19th century maps, especially those by the British. In 1823, Faden's business was bought by James Wilde Sr., and on his death in 1836, was taken over by James Wilde Jr. A major part of Wilde's business was republishing, with updates, the maps inherited from Faden. Wilde reissued Faden's large map of South America in 1838 and 1860, reusing the original plates, and he did not change the depiction nor text concerning the Golden Lake or Lake Parama. In this 1875 edition of the map, Wilde again reused older plates, but he finally showed at least a bit of caution. Looking at the detail of the map, one can see that the shoreline of the, the lake has been rubbed out of the plate, but the legend, Golden Lake, Lake Parama, remained. This is the last map I have found which shows the cartographic myth, which began almost three centuries before. But the El Dorado legend itself had not quite died out. In the late 1920s, Jimmy Angel, an American bush pilot, met an old prospector named James McCracken in a bar in Panama. McCracken regaled Angel with tales of a hidden El Dorado located in the Guiana Highlands on a high plateau surrounded by jungle, where the ground was supposedly covered with golden nuggets. Angel agreed to take McCracken to look for the site, and under McCracken's direction, they flew over the Gran Sabana of southern Venezuela, searching the towering mesas called Tepui for McCracken's El Dorado. According to Angel's account, they landed on top of one of the Tepui and were able to gather a large quantity of gold. Later, Angel couldn't remember how to get back, but he continued to search the last of the searches for El Dorado, but without success, or at least not in his search for gold. For in 1935, he did discover the world's tallest waterfall, which has been named Angel Falls after him. Thank you for watching this Philadelphia Print Shop West online lecture, which we hope you found interesting and informative. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. If you would like to see a selection of original antique maps, including some of this cartographic myth, please visit our website at pps-west.com.